the lecture today is going to be uh, given by Dr. Owen Dillon. Um, Owen is a postdoc here at the ImageX Institute, and he has a background in mathematics and image reconstruction. Um, he focuses mostly on CT and cone beam CT, um, which is the art of turning 2D X-ray images into a 3D patient anatomy. Um, but I'll let him talk more about that. Um, like always for these lectures, um, please, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in a the chat and I'll interrupt Owen in a, at an appropriate time, or you can just keep them till the end and there'll be a Q&A se uh, session at the end. Um, if you want an, an attendance certificate, please uh, email Julia, who will put her email in the chat, and then she will um, send you the attendance certificate. Um, and then, of course, you're welcome to have your camera on or off uh, throughout the meeting. It's up to you, really. Um, and if you're having any issues with the, um, the streaming, then it might be a good idea to turn off your video to get a better bandwidth. Um, and please make sure that you're muted, but I think everybody is. So without further ado, Owen, please uh, take the... Sure. Um, thanks for the introduction, Yusuf. So as Yusuf said, my research is mostly on computer tomography. I'll explain and x-ray imaging. I'll explain a bit more what that means. My background is much more in maths. Um, I try not to put too many scary equations on here, but we are going to go through the basic x-ray physics and the basic maths that underlies how this image reconstruction process really works. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions, but I will be trying to cover everything. So maybe wait one slide just to make sure that's not what's on the next slide. Okay. So what is X-ray tomography? Um, so X-rays are just a type of light that can mostly pass through people without being attenuated. Um, very low frequency light just gets absorbed. Very high frequency can mostly pass straight through. X-rays pass through, but a lot of them get absorbed. So we can see sort of a projection through the person. Um, when you, were, when you shine x-rays on a person, what you produce is a shadow image of that person's anatomy. Um, and that's kind of what we're showing on this figure over here. So we have some objects in 3D. If we shone some x-rays on that starting over on the left and detected it on that detector over on the right, everything gets kind of overlaid. Um, that can give you some information but really you want to know, you want to be able to resolve depth. Like that's really what we're seeing in 3D. And that's why we do tomography. Uh, tomography just means images where you're viewing a single slice through a 3D object. Tomos just means slice. Uh, and it's computed tomography because the process of going from these overlaid shadow projection images to tomographic images requires a computer. Um, you need to solve a lot of equations to do this. Uh, this is just a few examples of some data. So in the top left here, we have the actual acquired projection 2D x-ray images. And you can see the person's moving. And as we rotate around, all of the information is overlaid. But by having this overlaid image at lots of different angles, we can actually separate out where everything is in three dimensions. Uh, the image on the top right is just scrolling through a whole lot of reconstructed slices in this axis. And then down on the bottom row, we have the three standard slice views through the anatomy. So here we're slicing through like this. This slice, you can see the vertebrae back there, that's looking at this slice of anatomy. And then on the far right, we have the top down slice through the anatomy. So we want to go from the data on the top left to this bottom row. Uh, 
Okay, so before we get to the mathematics of how you would make that step from lots of 2D to a 3D, we'll just briefly talk about how X-rays really propagate through a person. So the rate at which your X-ray beam, the intensity of that beam will decay proportional to the electron density of the material that it's passing through. Um, this decay rate within a material is called its X-ray attenuation. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, this does depend on the, the attenuation depends on the spectrum of what you're putting through. And it's just X-rays relative to the tissue in people is a good mix so that you can actually get some stuff through on the other side. If everything went straight through, you wouldn't have any useful information. Uh, and what we're showing here is the intensity of an X-ray beam as it passed through a material composed of two different submaterials. So passing through empty space, we have no attenuation. Our intensity remains constant. When we hit this first material, we decay exponentially proportional to this attenuation coefficient, which I'm calling A1. We then move into material two, we still an exponential decay, but at this different rate. Um, and then once we're through the material, the beam intensity just stays completely solid again. Um, oh, Brennan just wants to say intensity is also a function of distance for diverging bees by inverse square law. Yes, that's completely true. Um, this would be the model for an X-ray beam that's really like, really a beam, like an X-ray laser. It's just going to decay in this nice proportional way. Um, and then the interesting thing to point out here, so decay is exponentially proportional to this coefficient. What that really means is that the derivative of intensity with respect to how far you're moving must be some number that we call A1. Um, the final intensity here that we measure is just going to be initial intensity times e to the negative a1 times how long we were in material one plus a2 times how long we were in material two. Um, and then on the far right here, we just have the dominant effects as to why the X-rays are being attenuated and really it's interactions with electrons in the material. And that's why I often make the point of saying the attenuation is proportional to electron density, which isn't quite the same as density of a material. Um, you could have two materials with different physical densities, like maybe one cube is heavier than another cube. Doesn't necessarily mean that the X-ray intensity is different. Okay. Well, now we'll start getting into the mathematics a little bit. So. What we're looking at here is trying to reconstruct just a 2D image made of pixels. In practice, we do 3D images and we say they're made of voxels, but the idea is completely the same. So we start off with, well, let's just look at this X-ray beam we have here. It starts off with intensity I naught. I define this material as having four pixels, each of a different attenuation, which I've denoted X1, X2, X3, X4. As I pass through the X1 part of my material for length L1, I'll decay exponentially by X1 times L1. I then enter material two, attenuation X2. I'm in it for length L2, X2, L2. So what I measure here is I naught times E to the negative X1, L1 plus X2, L2. And Dealing with stuff that's exponential is kind of annoying. So often the first thing that happens when we detect our X-ray intensity is we're going to divide by this initial intensity, which we know because we control the X-ray source. Uh, we'll take the log of that and then we'll just do negative what we have. And now we have a much more friendly looking equation, X1, L1 plus X2, L2. So we measure something, divide by I naught, take the log, go negative. And that just gives us the 
attenuations multiplied by how long we were on the path. So very easily interpreted data after that one little transformation. Um, so this gives us an equation for understanding X1 and X2, given what we measured. We know what L1 and L2 are because we know where the source was, we know where the detector was, we've defined the pixel size. Um, but the problem here is we have one data point for two unknowns, X1 and X2. So we have to take more data, get more data points to solve for the number of unknowns we have. Uh, so we send through another beam of X-rays that gives us some new set of equations. We're in X1 for length L1, X2 for length L2, X4 for length L3. We measure them and it's just their sum multiplied by the known lengths. Now we have two equations with three unknowns. And really just as we rotate around, sending through lots and lots of X-ray beams, measuring them all, we get a whole lot of linear equations. Um, for this particular scan geometry, we have um, exactly as many equations as unknowns. Uh, and this immediately you get some sense that if we want to have a higher resolution reconstruction, we're going to need to have more pixels on our detector, but also more view angles just to have enough equations to actually solve something meaningful. Um, we can express this all as just a linear equation. Measured stuff y is equal to a times x. x is a vector of all of our unknown attenuations. A is what we call the forward projection matrix. It's just made of how long we're inside each pixel region. We can derive A from our known geometry. And that relates to our measured intensities, the actual pixel values on our detector. And because this is just a linear equation, we can just, well, in this form, we could just solve this using standard linear algebra methods or even just your um, linear algebra that you would have done in high school, solve a system of linear equations. It's really not too bad. Um, when this becomes quite nasty is when you're dealing with more practical problems. So let's say you wanted to reconstruct an actual 3D volume of a person and you wanted to do it at pretty low resolution. So like 100 by 100 by 100 voxels. That means you have 100 times 100 times 100. So what, 10 million unknowns or no, 1 million unknowns. And on your, let's say you have a fairly low density detector, let's say it's 100 by 100 and you go 100 different view angles rotating around, you have 1 million measured data points, 1 million unknown, 1 million equations, 1 million um, data points. You can solve that, but it would be very, very slow, even for quite a low resolution reconstruction. Um, so we'd have to do something a bit more clever. Now, something that is quite clever is making use of the specific structure of the linear equations in computed tomography. Um, the first step to that is understanding this operator called back projection. So if our matrix A was the forward projector, give us an object, multiply by the forward projector, get what the measured projection should be. The back projector is just the transpose of that exact same matrix. We just flip everything around. And the form of it looks a bit, this is going through exactly that example we have before. It's a bit hard to read and make perfect sense of what is happening. But really, once you calculate this and try it for a few cases, you can see that the back projector, it takes your 2D images and it just smears them back through the object to the source. And this is surprisingly convenient because as we have more and more measured projection images, if we smear, if we smear one of those backwards, it looks like nothing. 
we rotate around, smear that one backwards, maybe it starts to look like something. And actually, as you rotate around smearing all of these back, that object that you get in the middle, your X's, looks more and more like just a very blurred version of the original image. Um, and I think I have some pictures of that in the next slide. So what we've got here, the true object was just like our true image was just a bright spot at this location. As we rotate around taking just 2D projection images, we would have you know, a bright spot that we detect moving around or moving along the detector as we rotate around this object because it's offset. Uh, if we back project just a few of those, we get unsurprisingly the things smeared back and they happen to coincide at that bright spot. If we rotate it around, this is basically infinitely many views and smeared them all back, we would get a very smeary bright spot, but it's at least something which is quite impressive. Uh, and then over here on this right column, we have a slightly more complicated ground truth than just a single dot. This is called the Shep Logan transform. And if we rotate it around taking many, many projections and then just applying the back projector, this is the image that we would see. And again, you can see it's just a super blurry version of that original image. So this process of going from measured data to actual underlying unknowns is called reconstruction. We're reconstructing images. This is called image reconstruction. This is quite a bad reconstruction of the image, but it is at least clear that there's a relationship here. This would not work for like a standard set of linear equations. You can't just take your matrix and rotate it and apply it. It's because of the specific structure of tomography and the forward projection matrix that this even looks kind of like something. Now, as we've been talking about, that gives you a very blurry image if you just back project everything. So someone very clever came up with this idea of filtered back projection to unblur the original image. Um, we apply a specific sharpening image filter called a ramp filter. Uh, and in the case that there was, that we measured every angle around the object, taking all of these projections and there was no noise in the data, then when we back project and filter, you can prove mathematically that that should get you exactly the initial image. Um, here we have a reconstruction process. This is our original ground truth. Here we've back projected and here we apply this analytically derived ramp filter. And you can see this is really quite good if we have basically perfect data. Um, now the derivation of that ramp filter is fairly complex. Uh, you need to be pretty confident with mathematics, especially this thing called the Fourier transform to work out what the ramp filter should be but you just need to know there's this thing called a ramp filter and that lets us reconstruct things quite simply. Um, somebody has a question in the chat. Uh, what is the ramp filter a function of? So if you were to take the, like this image is on some domain. If we took the, which I'll just call the spatial domain, you get this image. If you took the Fourier transform of this image, which is really taking this discrete thing and breaking it up into a sum of spatial sines and cosines, you get a new image. That's what the Fourier transform does. This uh, ramp filter exists in that Fourier domain and the Fourier transform of the ramp filter is a very simple shape. It's just angled up exactly like a ramp it's uh, zero in the middle, and then it goes up to one at the edges of that image. And when you multiply your back projected, the Fourier transform of your back projected image, when you multiply it with this ramp filter, 
you're effectively removing some of the very low frequency terms in the image, which makes sense because that's the stuff that makes things look blurry. It's the low frequency terms. Uh, and then when you inverse Fourier transform that back, you get a beautiful sharp image. Um, Brendan also asks, is the ramp filter different for each data set? Not really. Um, as you rotate around, the number of projections means you need to pre do this thing called pre-weighting your projections. Um, but that can also be analytically derived and you still end up applying, like it's just a, it really is just a weighting to your images. You multiply them by some scalar number, you back project them all, and then you whack on the exact same um, Fourier filter or the exact same ramp filter. Um, the derivation of this has to do with the observation that when you project onto something, what you're really doing is taking a very sharp, like you're taking this long wide kernel and doing a convolution of this kernel going across your image to get the integral along that path. Um, and then a few, because you're doing convolutions with kernels, you can equally re-express this in terms of the Fourier transform by something called the convolution theorem. And then that is how you derive the ramp filter. But there's a lot of maths, it looks really nasty, and there's a much more intuitive explanation, which is you smear everything back and you sharpen it and it works really quite well. Um, and again, I have to stress this only works because of the specific structure of the tomography problem. Um, if you had a, like when you have a linear system of equations, if solving it was as simple as do a transpose, multiply, apply a filter, you're done, that would be amazing. So this method is really fast. Um, now the next observation to make is that solution is exact. If you had infinitely many projection images at every possible angle and you had completely noise-free data and that is obviously not the case in practice. Um, you only acquire a relatively small number of projections because you don't want to give too much X-ray dose to the patient and projections are always going to be noisy. And it's kind of amazing that the filtered back projection estimate still looks quite good. Um, so what we have in the top row here is a, it's synthetic, but this is kind of like a ground truth person. And now on the bottom, this is what it looks like when you have maybe 100 projection images rotating around the patient. Uh, with typical levels of noise. If you took that data, filtered it, and back projected it, yeah, it looks pretty sharp. It kind of looks like the initial ground truth person, but there's obviously lots of artifacts in the image. Um, the most prominent that you can see is really in this top down view, which is how there's like these harsh streaks, like these lines through the image. It's kind of hard to describe them without just looking at them but this effect is called streaking. And that's probably the most common artifact in computed tomography images. And definitely that's the big giveaway that a given scanner is using a filtered back projection type reconstruction method is you will see some streaks. Um, now, as I've been saying, this is filtered back projection is computationally very efficient. Um, and that was crucial in the early days of computer tomography, like in say the eighties where computers just aren't what they are now. But by incorporating more physics and getting an, a, more of an understanding of what possible patients you might be imaging, you can incorporate further constraints and use more sophisticated methods for reconstructing the volume for your given data. Um, they're slower, 
but computers are faster now. So this is very much like a emerging field of research. Uh, so we've talked a bit about how you can solve this with solve these equations with the specific structure of the tomography problem. But let's work back to just the original formulation, thinking of this as a linear system of equations. So we can write our problem in just the very standard form, y is equal to a times x. And this is solve a linear set of equations. This is a very well studied general mathematical problem. Um, and the first observation or the first insight that you would make to something like this is that to reconstruct accurately or to reconstruct uniquely, you will need at least as many data points as you have reconstruction volumes. Again, high school maths, you need as many independent equations as you do unknowns to actually estimate those unknowns. Um, this is showing the simple example of we have two data points and we want to fit a three term polynomial. So our terms are x0, x1 times t and x2 times t squared. We can write that also as just a times x. And when you only have two data points, y1 and y2, we can still write this as an equation, but there's infinitely many choices of those parameters that actually match the data perfectly. So like this black line, that's an example of a um, choice of parameters that matches the data perfectly, but so is the blue line, so is the green line. These are all completely different sets of parameters, but they solve our equations. They match the data that we have. Um, and this can be a problem in tomography because we don't, we want to reduce the number of images that we're taking um, if we don't want to have to be butting our heads up against this kind of limit because for HD Im imaging, like thousand by thousand by thousand voxels, that's potentially a lot of projection images you would have to take to reconstruct it. Um, now the most common iterative method in computer tomography is called SART. And that's called, uh, it stands for Simultaneous Algebraic Iterative Reconstruction. Um, that an acronym is SART somehow. Now, the observation is when you don't have heaps of data, Y equals AX might not have a solution. Um, this can happen when there is too much noise or even just when there's any noise really in your data you might not be able to choose parameters so that everything is perfectly consistent. Um, so rather than trying to solve exactly, you would solve something that looks like this. We wanna choose our parameters X such that they minimize the difference between our measured Y and if we forward projected through X. So this is called matching the data. Uh, it's also known as the least squares solution, but we have a model, we have a data, choose the parameters so that when we apply the model to that, to those parameters, we get something very similar to the data. It's a very sensible approach to take. And so doing the minimization of this form has very well established iterative methods of solving it. So, by iterative methods, I mean, if we're at step K, we can get the K plus one SART estimate simply by taking our current estimate and then adding a little, adding a little bit. And we know that that little bit gets us closer towards the solution. Um, probably the thing to note in the actual iteration formula, okay, we have A transpose times Y, that's fine. We only need to do that once. And that is like, that's back project Y. So we back project Y once and that lets us get started. Uh, and then A transpose A times X. Okay. We take our current estimate, we forward project it. 
and then we back project that. So already this is like, we're at three times as much work, more or less, as filtered back projection, but it gives us this new direction to look at. Um, we add a little bit lambda of this new direction to our current estimate, that gives us the next estimate. Um, if we have lots of data, this iterative method is stable in that we can, each iteration actually gets us closer to a good solution. Um, a problem you can have with very low dose tomography is that this can be unstable and your first couple iterations get you closer to something good and then it just starts looking worse and worse. Um, and that has to do with this problem of uniqueness that we mentioned here, like the black line, which for some reason we consider that quite reasonable. That could be after two or three iterations of solving this equation, but then as we iterate more and more and more, we tend to get things that look more like this blue line or this green line, just kind of unreasonable choices of parameters because all we're doing is fitting to the data. And yeah, note that each time we wanna get a new direction and improve our iterate, we need to do another forward and back projection. So compared to filtered back projection, where you just do it once, this is always going to be relatively slow. Uh, I see I've got a message in the chat. Uh, Brendan asks, is forward and back projection equivalent in terms of computational cost? Uh, not quite mostly because of memory overhead, but in terms of the number of computations you have to do, they're exactly the same. Um, so it's a little like on a typical computer, it's a little bit rough, but normally if it takes 10 seconds to do a back projection, it's going to take pretty much 10 seconds to do a forward projection. Okay. So like I was saying, when there's not that much data, this iteration can be unstable and lead us off somewhere that we don't want. And this leads to the idea of regularization. Um, so that instability arises from the fact that your choice of X that minimizes this can have infinitely many solutions um, when you don't have that much data. If you have lots and lots of data, it is actually unique. It's like you're fitting a low term polynomial to heaps of data. There's one choice that gets you as close to your measured data as possible. But when we're doing fewer projections, it's there's infinitely many. And in some sense, we think some are more good than others. Um, so we can instead regularize the equation. So what that means is rather than just minimizing, so rather than just choosing a choice of parameters so that it matches the data well, we include this regularization on our parameters. And this is some term that penalizes choices of parameters that we think are So what does this mean? I say that each time I iterate, I need to choose something that gets me closer to the data, uh, closer to the measured data for a given set of parameters. And my parameters all have to be positive, well, non-negative. Um, and the reason to do that is typical patients are not emitting X-rays on their own from within their bodies but that's what you would have to have to have a uh, negative attenuation value. That would mean there's part of the patient that's blasting x-rays out, which that could happen if they've been injected with something weird, but they've probably got bigger problems to deal with than um, the instability of least squares if they have to deal with that. Um, Another sensible constraint to include might be what's called smoothness. Uh, this is very commonly included. And what that means is that if this voxel is highly attenuating, then the voxel next to it should probably be highly attenuating. Um, and that's very sensible when you're looking at people 
because this voxel is highly attenuating. That probably means it's a bit of bone. It's probably next to a bit of bone. Um, obviously that can run into problems when you're at the boundary of the bone because now you know going from bone to muscle those two things are right next to each other and there's quite a big jump in their uh, attenuation but we'll come back to that the important thing about the smoothness condition is that it's also just a linear least squares term so it can this kind of equation can actually be solved not that intractably more work than just solving the SART equation. And then the thing that is probably the most commonly used regularizer in computed tomography, and is sometimes referred to as compressed sensing, which you may have come across in other fields, is really this idea of flatness. And what that means, or total variation. And that means we penalize we want our parameters to match the data, plus we want this thing called the total variation to be low. And total variation is just, you sum up the absolute difference between voxel neighbors. And because it's just absolute difference, um, one really big jump is about as bad as a whole lot of little, little jumps. And what this means in terms of a person is when you're looking at a whole region of bone, that shouldn't have a whole lot of little, little jumps because that would basically be like streaks or like noise when you're within that lump of bone. It should really be pretty homogeneous attenuation in that region. Um, but then when you get to the boundary between bone and muscle, that is like one big jump, but one big jump isn't too bad in terms of total variation. Um, one big jump isn't as bad as a whole lot of little jumps, which would be like a blurry boundary between the bone and the muscle. So total variation is quite a useful regularizer when you're imaging people. Uh, it would be bad if you were imaging like yogurt, where you're trying to figure out the smooth distribution of different levels of how much it's gone off basically but in people it's quite good and this is just showing for the same acquired data a few reconstructed images um, they're in separate slices but here we have a person that has been reconstructed with filtered back projection and you can see like it's pretty good, but it's kind of noisy. And really in the top down view, the amount of streaking is quite apparent. Uh, over here, we have something reconstructed with SART and we're lucky in this case in that we had enough data that it could, it was fairly stable in its iterations. Um, but there's lots of other problems with this image. Uh, probably the most noticeable is that there is still a degree of streaking. You could even argue maybe that the streaks are a bit sharper. Um, that's because this was still a relatively low dose scan. And there's a big issue in SART or any iterative scheme when you have stuff that's outside of your field of view, because that's still contributing to your data. So you're still trying to choose parameters that match that data, um, but you're not allowing your reconstruction to go further out and match where the bits of anatomy were that actually contribute to that. Um, so you can make your reconstruction field bigger, but then the method is even slower. Um, so there is a bit of a trade-off there. And lastly, this is with total variation regularization. And you can really see that a lot of that streaking and noise has been crushed out thanks to that regularization term. Um, in this case, the, there's still a bit of blur. And what that's really coming from is the fact that this patient is legitimately blurry um, because of some other physics, but also the patient was moving when the scan was taken. Um, so 
there should be like a smooth boundary at the top of their diaphragm as they're breathing because that was moving up and down. It should be blurred out in your reconstruction, but the total variation struggles with that. And you can make this sharper or more like SART by just increasing how you want to balance keeping the total variation low relative to matching the data well with your reconstruction and just ramping up the number of iterations, making the reconstruction field of view bigger, all that sort of thing. Um, and probably the final thing to note looking at these images is that a typical style of scan on a typical system, filtered back projection really looks pretty good. Um, you're not gaining much other than the computations taking much longer with these other scans, but that is much less the case when you're doing very low dose scans. Um, and for example, if your arc was limited to, let's say you could only rotate through 90 degrees for whatever reason, uh, the filtered back projection really doesn't look like anything. Um, whereas these other ones can by choosing parameters appropriately. Okay, um, one more thing that I'd like to talk about, which is more relevant to the type of research that I do at the group is motion compensation. So rather than just setting, thinking of your patient as one set of parameters X, you should really be thinking of them as multiple parameters that I've just indexed as XJ, um, where each one corresponds to a certain stage through the patient's respiratory cycle. Um, and by restricting J, we can reconstruct the patient using filtered back projection for just that phase of the cycle by only filtering and back projecting the images acquired at that phase. Um, and that's sort of what I'm showing down on this bottom row. Here we have an image when we filter and back project everything, and it's pretty blurry because the patient was moving around a lot. Uh, over here, we have where we filter and back project at each of these frames, only the data acquired when the patient was at a particularly respiratory state. Uh, you can see it's much more noisy. We're doing a 10 bin reconstruction. So it's like there's each of these frames is only using one tenth of the data relative to this. So yeah, it's, it's more noisy. You have this data, but at least the boundaries of stuff that is moving is really well defined because we're only looking at the anatomy when it's at a particular stage. Uh, if you were doing a regularized reconstruction or even an iterative method, rather than just looking at the information of a particular phase, you can share information between those phases to some extent by either imposing that each image should be similar to each other in some way or, um, I mean, that's really the main one. So we should be matching the data and each of our frames should be similar, but not exactly the same. Um, and then the thing that we do more of in the group, which is just proven to be probably the most effective method is accounting for the motion explicitly. So if we know X at J, for example, from a prior CT scan, we know how the patient should look there. We can apply this warping, which takes us from a phase K, like what the patient looks like when they're at respiratory phase K, we warp it to look like how they look at phase J. So we can get that warping from somewhere. In the case of lung cancer radiotherapy, the patient often has a previous 4D CT scan, which is like a very high dose 4D filtered back projection image. And we can just you filter and back project all of the data that we acquired, but warp it corresponding to where we think the patient should have been based on that prior scan. And this is called motion compensated filtered back projection. And that's what we have in this last image here. And you can see it's a bit more of a balance, like where things weren't moving, we've got pretty similar, you know, good contrast, well-defined images, like when we do 
a filtered back projection with all of the data in the 3D case, but we can also see stuff moving around as well. In the case of this patient, there's still a bit of motion blur when we did the filtered back projection, and that's arising from the fact that our motion compensation wasn't perfect in this case. Um, so stuff was a little bit misplaced when we do the filtered back projection, so edges which are moving end up a little bit blurred. Okay, and just the last thing that I want to show you, which is kind of the scary bit, is the real equation. So if you want to model all of the physics as these x-rays are passing through a patient. So often we've been saying, you know, it's our equation is y equals ax. In reality, it's always y is equal to ax plus some error term. Um, but the real problem is measured data D, that is going to be, well, there's still gonna be some kind of error term. And then our X is actually, so our parameters, our attenuation coefficients are actually a function of the energy of the X-rays that are passing through. So, you know, when you, if it was shining visible light, all of the attenuation parameters should be very, very high valued because a person just stops visible light. Um, for higher energy X-rays, they should be lower values. The relationship between beam energy and attenuation isn't quite linear, so that's a bit hard, but it is a function of the energy. And because we're shining just from an X-ray source that does quite a wide spectrum of X-ray energies coming out of it, that is something that we need to consider when we're doing the reconstruction. Um, this is sometimes called the beam hardening effect, but our attenuation is a function of the X-ray energies that we shine in. Uh, I also have this term S acting of X, and this is the scatter. So we've been pretending X-rays just go in a straight line through the patient, gets absorbed nice and evenly, and then detected. They can actually get bounced off and go in funny directions, and then they get detected on a pixel that you weren't expecting, but it's still contributing to the data. So there's still this measured scatter term in your data, which is horrible to account for. Uh, going back to just the standard forward projection, okay, it's relative to the energy, but what we measure first goes through a Poisson process. So there is this inherent noise um, coming from the fact that we are measuring individual X-rays passing through, which each have their own probability of making it through. So even if everything was exactly the same, if you take two X-ray images, you will get, well, like you take an X-ray image twice, exactly the same, you will get two different images because of this quantum noise effect related to the fact that it's just individual X-rays passing through, each with their own probability of actually making it and being detected. And then really there is this extra measurement operator which relates, okay, X-ray arrives at the detector, something weird happens when it actually gets measured. Um, it might get spread out a bit by how our pixels on the detector actually respond to energy, but something else is happening as well. So if we wanted to fully you know, reflect all of the physics that we know is happening in our equation, we would end up with a horrific equation like this and solving this for X as a function of E is way more computational burden. Um, in theory, you could get better image quality doing this, but like the computational resources in the clinic are still so short of being able to account for all of these physical effects. Um, and that does impose a physical limit on how good our image quality can get with the models that we're using currently. Okay, well, thanks everyone for listening to all of that. Uh, I know it gets, there's some bits that are quite simple and some bits that are quite complicated. So happy to take any questions. Thanks, Alan. Um, I will let anybody who has a question, I think you answered all of the, of Brenda's question in the chat already.
Um, so does anybody else have any questions? I have more questions if no one else does. You can go ahead. Brandon. I guess on your last slide, I was wondering, say that we could perfectly account for all of these effects, how much better would the images be? Like it sort of seems so, like we're maybe chasing small gains. It's a little bit hard to know exactly how much the image quality would improve because whenever you're accounting for additional physics, um, there is like any estimation of how those physics were operating in practice will have a certain amount of estimation error. Um, but in dedicated experiments that try and isolate some of these effects, um, that's when you can get more of a practical idea of how much the image quality improves. So for example, cone beam CT, which is you have a big flat panel. I know Brendan knows this, but just for the students, cone beam CT, you have a big 2D flat panel detector and your X-rays are following this big cone getting to that detector. Um, because it's this big wide thing, scatter has more of an impact on your measured data there because everything, basically everything that gets scattered still arrives at the detector and contributes to your data. So scatter is more of a issue in your reconstruction. Now compare that to regular CT. So in regular CT, rather than a big flat panel, you have more like a detector strip and they also put physical metal collimators in this, uh, in front of that strip. And what that means is that pretty much everything that gets detected there did actually go in a straight path from the source to the detector. Pretty much it's all there. So the scatter is effectively removed from that data. And that's why, at least why people think image quality in CT is much higher than in cone beam CT. Um, so even if you took heaps of cone beam CT images, which you wouldn't normally do, the image quality is still quite a lot worse than CT. And the only reason people can really think of why that might be the case is because there's this extra scatter effect that you're not accounting for properly in the cone beam data, but it's physically removed for you from the CT data. I have a question if nobody else has any question. Oh. Also, just as a note, um, if you want an attendance or to get Julia's, put our email in the chat uh, again. Um, I, oh, and I was wondering when you have a, when you take a CT like in practice, the patient, like you never take a full 360 of the patient in a slice, then move the patient, take another 360 and so on. I mean, I, I, maybe that's how they used to do it, but these days it's more like the patient is moving in a continuous pattern and you only get like a certain amount of angle per slice. How does that complicate the mathematics of it or does it complicate it at all? So I would say that in standard clinical systems, they still make sure to move the patient slow enough that maybe they won't get a full 360 degree rotation of data, but they'll probably get more like a 200 degree rotation. And like mathematically, that's actually enough for filtered back projection. Um, you need one, like you need 180 degrees plus um, like half the detector size for filtered back projection to work. Um, and that's very easy to understand when you're thinking of parallel beams. So if all of your beams were going straight through rather than in this like fan, which makes the geometry a bit annoying, then if you see something from angle one, you'll just see the exact thing rotated from angle one plus 180 degrees. Um, so you didn't need to take that extra arc of projections. When it's a fan, it's a little bit different, and that's why they need like 180 and a bit, but the standard scanners do do 180 and a bit. There is 
a slight difference though in some scanners which are trying to do very fast or very low dose images they might not actually acquire enough for filter back projection but they may acquire enough for those regularized iterative methods to work um, so when like sometimes in dental cone beam ct systems just because it's going into a clinic where there wouldn't be space for it to move more those might only do a 90 degree rotation. And then they take a long time doing computations. Oops, I think you dropped out, Owen. <laughs> then they give you a pretty good 3D image. Um, so those are using these. I'm just going to keep talking until somebody says they can hear me. All right, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, um, point is, most scanners make sure to take enough data for filter back projection. Some can't, they use these other methods. All right, we have three minutes left if somebody else wants to ask a question. No, all right then. Uh, thank you, Owen, for presenting. Um, Anybody who wants an attendance certificate, I know that I keep repeating myself, but please just email Julia. If she has our email in the chat, I'll leave the Zoom meeting running until 4 p.m. So you can just copy the chat if you want to, uh, but otherwise feel free to leave uh, the meeting whenever. And if you have more questions for Owen, then feel free to ask. <laughs>